This poem's called The Journal. You know, there remains something about the power of a parcel. As a kid, I remember they would arrive wrapped in thick, plain brown paper and they'd be tied up with, with brown string. I couldn't wait to open it. Well, not much has changed, except for the string. I still get excited. I reckon it's because of the possibilities that come with the surprise, the intrigue, the expectations, and maybe even sometimes some fear. And all of that before the contents are revealed. I'd like you to share a thought with Dave Murray. He's the guy in this poem as he opens his parcel. It's called a journal. Dave Murray sat relaxing, as he'd often done before, and while reflecting on the day, a knock upon the door. There stood a man in uniform, which he wore with pride. He introduced himself and asked to come inside. A chaplain in the Air Force, he proceeded to explain that he'd come to this address to verify a name, to inquire about Dave's father. Didn't get to have his say. I never knew my father. He died before my day, though my mother two years later also passed away, which makes your journey here a wasted one, OK? The chaplain sensed the anger through his actions and his tone, an anger that gave reason for him living all alone. He asked Dave of his father's name. The reply lit up his face. After years of constant searching, he'd finally found a trace. The officer moved closer, and with compassion, touched his hand. There's a story I must tell, with a hope you'll understand. Your father flew a moth in a war to end all wars. He spent his time up north to help patrol our shores. His duty was to warn should the enemy attack, but on his last patrol he failed to make it back. A search was quickly mounted to survey the land around, but despite their every effort, his plane was never found until the local council back in 1982 began to open up the forest by putting access through and two young surveyors working in a place where few had been came across a wreck wedged tight in a ravine they brought back information that has since been verified it was your father's plane it still lays there on its side then he handed him a parcel secure and firmly bound it's his goggles in the journal from where his plane was found. I've read the story that it tells. And if I were you, I think, before I started reading, I'd mix myself a drink. The chaplain rose to leave, expressing tenderness once more, and Dave nodded as he shook his hand and slowly closed the door. He took that chaplain's good advice and mixed himself a drink, then slowly unwrapped the parcel not knowing what to think. The goggles glass had cracked, the brass had turned all green, and he held them to his face to paint a picture of the scene. He paused for just a moment, then slowly shook his head. He put the goggles down and picked the journal up instead. The pages, soft and yellow, had stood the test of time, his writing clear and neat, and spaced along each line. He told the details of each mission, directions flown and where, some notes on observation and the time spent in the air. Then the entries changed. It was where the crash occurred. The writing was untidy, as if he'd struggled with each word. I thought I'd seen some movement. I dropped lower down to see, and I was either shot or the prop was caught a tree. I struggled to gain altitude to try and make it to the beach, but the engine coughed and died. The coast was out of reach. I tried to put her down where I thought I would be seen, but she continued dropping till she crashed in this ravine. My legs are firmly held where the fuselage caged in, so now I sit here waiting, like a sardine in a tin. I saw a plane fly over about two hours ago. I had no way to signal, and they had no way to know. The trees that hide my plane provide shelter from the heat, I'm running low on water. I've nothing left to eat. It's been two days since the crash. Still they don't arrive. The water and the food are gone. It's a fight to stay alive. My legs are still both caught. But now I feel no pain. 
I wonder when they find me, if I'll ever walk again. It rained again last night. I caught enough to drink. I've heard no other planes. There's somewhere else, I think. And with the turning of each page, the writing became worse as he recorded all his thoughts from the seat that was his hearse. At first I thought I could survive, but now I doubt I'm able. An act of God or a twist of fate has sadly turned the table. The stench within the cockpit is worse than rotting eggs. I cannot move. I feel no pain. I know it is my legs. Another dawn the sun comes up, I cook within its heat. I realise now the time is near for God and I to meet. I think of all the things that were never ever said. I realise now I've missed my chance, so I'm writing them instead. To my wife, I see her still as she waits to be a mother. I thank you for my life with you. I love you as no other. I curse this bloody war that took me from our home and leaves you there as I am here, afraid and all alone. Please tell our unborn son when you think he'll understand. I'm sorry I'm not there to guide his tiny hand. If this journal should be found long after I am gone, I humbly ask you do your best to see that it's passed on. That was the final entry. But there was so much more unsaid. Dave sat back. His eyes filled up. He slowly shook his head. When he'd been old enough to know that his parents were both dead, he was told that some belongings had been stored up in the shed. Now those things that he'd been given, and for thirty years he'd kept, had purpose and some meaning, and as he searched, he wept. Among those items stored away, he found a painting wrapped in cloth. It was of a man in uniform, alongside a tiger moth. And that old dusty painting that he long since chose to hide has since been resurrected, now holds a place of pride. And the goggles in the painting are in fact the very same as those that now hang proudly from the corner of the frame.